Hi, thanks for joining the TechSoup webinar today, Ask the Expert, and we do have some experts to be with us today. It's Amazon Web Service. My name is Aretha Simons. I'm the webinar producer here at TechSoup. This is being recorded, so you'll get the recording within 48 hours, I promise you. For everybody who's registered, you'll get the recording. I want to just show you how you can participate with us today. Um, you already know that you're muted, right? So you're going to use the Q&A to ask questions. You can also ask questions in the chat room. Um, they have experts here to answer your questions here in the chat room. If you need the closed caption, please turn on the closed caption using the CC button located in your Zoom menu. Um, again, we will record this and you'll get the recording within 48 hours. If you hear something that you like, aha, I need to share this, go ahead and share it with us and tag us on social media. Share with all your friends because we want everybody to know this information. We're going to the cloud, so let's get ready, right? So I'm going to move out the way and turn it over to the two experts who are here today. I'd like to introduce Jamin Gluck. He is the global manager for Amazon Web Services. And then Mike George, he's a senior solution architect at Amazon Web Services. Mike, I'm going to turn this over to you. Take it over. All right. Thank you so much, Aretha. And it's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Jamin Gluck, and I am here with my colleague, Mike George, and we are both from the AWS nonprofits team. Specifically, I'm a global program manager for AWS nonprofits. And today is really dedicated to connecting with you and understanding what your questions are so we can enable you and empower you to leverage AWS for mission impact. So before we get started, I just want to set some uh, little ground rules and talk a little bit about how you can make the best use of this webinar. So the first things first in terms of an announcement is that the links will be available in the chat. So I'm about to speak about a couple of different programs that are happening here at AWS in support of nonprofits. Profits, and I'll provide you with those links in the chat. So definitely check that out. Additionally, this is your time. This is dedicated to helping you understand how AWS can support your organization. So please ask the questions. There's no such thing as a bad question. We will do our best to get to all the questions, but pop those questions as they come into your head into the chat and we'll spend some time afterwards. And then last, if you want to just make sure you can see a slide a little bit better, um, here are some of the instructions in order to zoom in on your screen. So in terms of an agenda today, um, first I'll be speaking about the AWS nonprofit programs. Again, what resources and programs are available to help your organization leverage AWS for mission impact? Then I'll pass the mic over to my colleague, Mike, and he'll discuss a little bit about what's currently happening with your peers in terms of the ways that they're leveraging AWS to achieve their missions. And then of course, we'll definitely save time at the end for any questions and providing answers. Again, this is your time. This should be conversational. This is an opportunity for you to learn from us, the AWS experts, about the ways that you can use this technology. So jumping right into the AWS nonprofit programs, I want to spotlight four. The first one is the AWS nonprofit credit program. And this credit program works in collaboration with TechSoup to provide $1,000 in AWS promotional credits. This credit is excellent if you're just getting started on the cloud or if you're well on your way in your journey while using AWS. It's a way to lower the impact financially of your use of AWS. Additionally, we have the Imagine Grant Program. And while the submissions are currently closed, they're opening in the near future. And this is a program that encourages and inspires organizations of all shapes and sizes to submit their ideas about the ways that cloud can, technology can help their organization succeed. And we provide credits as well as cash to a select few organizations. Additionally, definitely want to save the date and moreover even register for the upcoming in-person conference uh, called the Imagine Nonprofit Conference. This year, it's on March 22nd and 23rd in Washington, D.C., and we encourage you to register not only for the in-person one if you're able to make it there, but there's also options for tuning in virtually. And then 
again, we pride ourselves on our ability to connect with our customers and make ourselves available to organizations, no matter their question and no matter their size. So I'll put a link in the chat for an, a way that you can connect with someone like me or like Mike to ask your questions even beyond this webinar. So um, definitely have the opportunity to speak to an AWS expert directly. So with that, I'll pass the mic over to my colleague to discuss a little bit more about how nonprofits are leveraging AWS. All right. Hi, everyone. So my name is Mike. I am a solutions architect with AWS working with nonprofits. And so today what we're going to be doing is talking about how you can roadmap your journey to the cloud. And I want to start out by, first of all, talking about what other nonprofits are doing in the cloud. I think this is helpful to you know, see, again, what are, what are others doing? And, and that can help uh, spur ideas for, for ways that you can for, uh, push your organization forward by moving to the cloud. The first organization I wanna talk about is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You're probably familiar with, with Rock Hall. They have a lot of physical and digital assets related to the history of rock and roll. And, you know, until recently, the Rock Hall used a lot of different technologies to store its files, and some of the storage mediums that they used to preserve material were outdated, they were expensive to maintain, and they were prone to failure. And, you know, you think about the kind of data that the Rock Hall has. They, they have videos of induction ceremonies, they have B-roll, they have artist interviews, and they have live concerts from some really unique artists like Aretha Franklin, Paul McCartney, Led Zeppelin, Elton John, uh, Prince, and you know, many, many more. And so they've got some really valuable uh, assets as it relates to the history of rock and roll. So they launched a plan in uh, 2015 to better preserve some of these assets. And they started out small. They... Uh, you know, to save these assets, they, they landed on using Amazon S3, which is our uh, durable object storage in the cloud solution. And then for objects that, that maybe they didn't need quite so fast uh, retrieval, they used uh, Amazon S3 Glacier Deep Archive, where they could store it, uh, still get access to it if they needed to, but it would take maybe a little bit longer. But that trade-off then was they have a much lower storage cost per object. And, and so that's what they, they landed on. They then began to, um, and they, they ended up uh, storing some objects that are two to three terabytes in size. Once they started saving some of the, these objects, some of these videos that, that encapsulate the history of, of rock music, they began to build on the success by building out a digital management platform to support the organization of these video assets. So you can see in their example, they started out small and then they built on the success that they were able to do. And you know, since, uh, since they began this process, they've been able to preserve over 2000 different video files that equates to around 300 terabytes of, of video assets. Let's look at another organization. Code.org, you may be familiar with Code.org. And Code.org operates a learning platform that uh, allows classrooms from all over the world, or basically students from K through 12 all over the world to learn about computer science concepts. And Code.org runs an annual Hour of Code event. And you know they really feel like they have one chance to get it right. During their Hour of Code event, they oftentimes, oftentimes see 10 times the traffic that they see during regular, uh, you know, during other parts of the year. And they, they feel like they have this one chance to get it right because, you know, when students come to their, their site during the hour of code, some of those students may not want to be there. They may not want to learn about computer science uh, techniques, but code.org feels like, okay, if we can get people to come in, then we can get them interested in computer science, which could, you know, literally change some of their lives. And so, to, to make sure that they had the, the reliability and the scalability that they need to, to really get it right the first time, code.org moved their infrastructure to AWS. They, uh, they, they found that they were able to support millions of, of uh, school-aged children from hundreds of countries around the world, uh, again, supporting 10 times the traffic that they normally see. They did this by, by putting their their servers on Amazon EC2, and they took advantage of Amazon, I'm sorry, advantage of AWS auto scaling so that they could adjust their capacity up 
or down depending on the amount of traffic they see. So during an uh, hour of code event, they scale their systems up, people access their sites, as that traffic goes away, they scale back down and they pay for only what they use. And they found that in doing this, uh, not only were they able to support this, this influx of, of students, but they ended up saving money in the process. So, so that's an example of, of what code.org is doing. The, the next one I wanna talk about briefly is the Los Angeles LGBT Center. The, uh, the, the center really wanted to build a call center uh, and they had a, a couple of people on staff that had experience building call centers and they knew it was typically a fairly complex process. A lot of upfront planning, planning usually needed to, to take place. So um, when they wanted to build this call center, they looked at a number of solutions and ended up settling on Amazon Connect, which is our virtual call center in the cloud solution. Much to their surprise, they found that they could build a call center in literally a matter of minutes. And they ended up building, like fleshing out that call center and releasing it within about a week. They were surprised with how easy that was. You know, they were able to go from uh, a simple idea to testing this out to have a fully deployed, scalable, secure solution in literally just a couple of days. So this saved them time and money and resources that they could then use in for you know pushing their mission forward. And it's important to understand that the, the call center that they've set up is, is largely the face of the center for individuals that don't come in uh, directly. So individuals can call in and have you know, ask questions about upcoming appointments or you know, things related to mental health services or really anything that the center does. The center has 50 staff members that support 30,000 clients in the clinic. Uh, one other thing that they were able to do that was pretty interesting is they ended up doing a fundraising event with KTLA, which is their local uh, TV station. Uh, they, uh, they had a live telethon and during the telethon, they were able to raise $1.3 million. As the calls came in, they were able to scale out their call center. As the tele telethon ended, they were able to scale in their call center, again, paying only for what they use without any upfront costs or um, anything like that. And the, the last nonprofit I want to talk about is Mercy Corps. And Mercy Corps has a mission of alleviating suffering, poverty, and oppression by helping people build secure, productive, and just communities. Mercy Corps works in over 40 countries, and they have over 5,000 team members who work side by side with people who are living through poverty, disaster, violent conflict, and the, you know, living through the, the impacts of climate change. One of Mercy Corps' Uh, missions was they wanted to identify the price of a food basket. And a food basket, if you're not familiar, is the, the basic staples that uh, someone needs to survive. So this will include usually things like rice or flour and a, a number of other things. They found that as if they could predict the price of each of the items within a food basket, they would then have good indicators on when they needed to uh, work with other NGOs to bring aid into the country. And so they actually did this in Syria. They, they uh, calculated the price of a food basket through some AI ML services that AWS offers. They found that they had a, around an 88% accuracy per food basket item. And this helped them, again, uh, be much more responsive to the, the needs of, of the user, or the needs of, of their community. So the needs of the you know, uh, people within Syria that, that needed aid. So that's some examples of what other nonprofits are, are, are doing with the cloud. What I wanna do now though is briefly, I just wanna pause for a second and ask what are, where are all of you in your cloud journey? You know, are you asking what's the cloud? If, if you are, what I'd like you to do is go to the chat and put in a one. If you're aware of the cloud, but not really doing anything in there, put a two. If, if you'd like to run something in the cloud, but you're not really sure where to start, put in a three. If you're thinking of running workloads, put a four. And if you're actually running workloads, put a five in there. And let's just see where everybody is at. I just lost my Zoom. So <laughs> give me a sec so I can see what everyone's response is. No worries. Uh, Jamin here. We're getting kind of a mix. Lots of ones, but also seeing some fours, some fives, some twos. So it sounds like we've got a good mix in terms of competency and experience using the cloud, but 
definitely a good group of those ones and twos just learning how to get started. Okay, awesome. All right, so let's talk about some benefits of moving to the cloud. So when you think about moving to the cloud, when I talk with customers that are, are thinking about moving to the cloud, they typically think of AWS with you know these things here, like the kind of the core infrastructure building blocks, like compute. You know, I need servers, I need security tools, I need inf I, I need uh, locations where I can deploy this, and and that's definitely true. You can get that with AWS, but we also have. Uh, over 200 services built on these kind of these core foundations. And one of our, our goals is to help push you further up the stack. And, and so by that, we mean, you know, if, if you're managing a server, that's actually distracting you from doing something with your mission. You know, there's nothing that differentiates, if, if you're managing a server, there's nothing about managing that server that differentiates you as an organization or differentiates your mission. It's it's keeping the lights on work. And, and we often call that work undifferentiated heavy lifting. That's the muck of keeping the lights on. You know, it's important muck, but it's it's not differentiating muck. So that's why we have these, these higher level services that you can leverage that allow you to move faster. And so these are things like virtual desktops in the cloud. Uh, we have services to support IoT. We have machine learning services. If you have a lot of machine learning experience, great. We have tools to support that. If you have no idea what machine learning is, great. We have tools to support that as well. We have tools to support analytics. We have media service uh, uh, services so that you know you can transcode video and deploy it and, and you know broadcast and you know make it easy to uh, to have video on demand. Um, we, we have solutions to easily build mobile applications and database platforms. And anyway, there's a lot of different services here. So, uh, you know, part of what I want to do is in terms of talking about the different nonprofits, the different stories we've talked about, we, we gave you some really simple examples of starting out small. And we had some examples that are maybe a little bit outside the box, like call center solutions and AIML solutions. So there's a lot of different things you can do by moving to the cloud. In fact, we typically see that there are five main things that, that nonprofits get when they move to the cloud. And the first thing that we generally see that nonprofits get is agility. What that means is you can easily spin up resources as you need them. So that means you can spin up you know, hundreds or thousands of servers if you needed to. But this also means that you can really quickly develop and roll out new applications. So you can, you can experiment and you can innovate more quickly and frequently and if experiment fails, you know, no harm, no foul, you just turn it off. The, the second advantage that we see nonprofits get is cost savings. Um, it, you know, again, you're paying only for what you use and it's, you think of it like a light switch. When you're in your home and you flip a, a switch, the power company sends electricity to that light bulb, right? Likewise, when you turn off the switch, the power turns off. It's the same way with cloud computing. You want to turn on that switch, pay for the server that you're using, and when you turn it off, you don't want to pay for it anymore. And that's exactly what you can do. The, the third advantage we see nonprofits see is elasticity. And, and what this really means is, you know, if you've ever had to manage uh, an on-prem data center or otherwise have to you know, manage capacity, you really need to buy enough servers and enough capacity to support your organization at peak levels of activity, but you don't need to worry about that in the cloud. You pay for only what you use. And if you need more servers, you can spin those up. And if you need less servers, you can spin those down. And again, you only pay for what you use. And you can put safeguards in place so that that automatic scaling can happen for you up to a certain predefined threshold that, that you define. And then when you want to scale down, you can scale down to a certain predefined threshold that you define. The, the fourth reason that, or the fourth main thing that we see that nonprofits can get access to is innovation. So this is especially true with nonprofits that it, you, can, you can certainly innovate in, in IT or from an IT perspective in a nonprofit, but it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of funding. And that's typically outside the realm of what most nonprofits want to do or are able to do. And by using AWS, you can get access to the latest services and features, and you know you benefit from what AWS is providing, 
you know, and you don't have to build it yourself. And, and that means that you can spend more time working on your mission and trying to differentiate what you're trying to do as an organization instead of that undifferentiated heavy lifting that I mentioned earlier. The, the last main thing that the nonprofits get from moving to the cloud is our global footprint. So you, you can deploy globally literally in minutes. Uh, like if you wanted to deploy servers to Singapore right now, we could. I mean, it's, it's, it's trivially easy to deploy servers anywhere in the world. All right, so there's a lot there. So now the, the natural question is, okay, how do you get started? So let me tell you, it's a very easy approach to get started. Now, with that said, keep in mind that every organization's cloud journey is unique. To succeed in your transformation, you know, you really need to think about what are you trying to do? What is the, the benefit that you get from going to the cloud? That's really that envision phase that I have up here. In the envision phase, you identify the why. What are you doing and what value does it bring? If, if you can, in, once you've done that envisioning phase, once, once you've identified your why of moving to the cloud, then you can move to phase two, which is aligning. Aligning is figuring out the, the who and the what. Once you've figured that out, you can launch. Launching is just, in many cases, as simple as deploying something to the cloud. And then once you've deployed, you can measure it. You can figure out if there are any gaps that you want to refine. And then you can go to the scale phase where you, again, measure those gaps and you keep refining what you've built. Uh, or you can build new services and features. And so we really see this as a continuous process from figuring out the, the what that I want to do to figuring out how I'm going to do it to building and launching, to then looking at any gaps or any next steps and continuing this process over and over again. Okay, so I've explained these, these four steps briefly. Uh, Jamin, maybe you could help me out. What I'd like you to do is in the chat, if you're in the envision phase, I'd like you to put a one in there. If you're in the, uh, so envision phase is figuring out the, the what of what you want to do in the cloud. If you're in the alignment phase, uh, where you're trying to figure out the how and the who, put a two in the chat. If you're launching things right now in the cloud, put a three. And if you're, if you've already done these things, but you're looking back to see what we've done and you're refining and improving, put a four in there. So we're seeing a lot of ones, some twos. I see one four, Mike, okay. but perhaps you can speak a little bit about what our audience members who are in the one phase might be able to do to move forward towards four. Yeah, so that's exactly what we're gonna talk about here. So what I wanna do now is I wanna look at each of these four topics and talk through, okay, what does this actually mean? And let me give you some concrete examples of what a nonprofit could do. So let's start out with the Envision phase. Now in the, the lower right-hand corner, hopefully you can see I've got a map so you can orient where we are. We're in the Envision phase right now. Again, the Envision phase is really identifying what do you want to do in the cloud? And, and having a goal is oftentimes all you need to get started. Think about what do you want to get out of moving to the cloud? Is it better efficiency? Is it cost savings? Is it organizational transformation? Maybe you want access to technologies or tools or services that you don't currently have access to, or maybe it's something else, but you need, need to identify this why of your cloud journey. And once you've identified the why, you can then align this vision among your other, your, your other stakeholders. Okay, so let's give you some concrete examples here. So maybe as an example, uh, you want to increase fundraising, that, you know, that's your goal. And you identify that you can do that through maybe better donor management, or maybe you want to have personalized email campaigns to help encourage donation among some of your uh, more generous donors. So those are some that that would be an example of a why, or maybe you don't need to worry about fundraising. And uh, or, well, everyone has to worry about fundraising. Maybe what you want to do is you want to worry about, or you want to sh do a better job showing the impact that your organization has towards its mission. So your why there might be, I want to produce public dashboards to better show that impact. So those are some examples there. But again, the the first phase is really figuring out. That, that why, the, the, the value that you can get from moving to the cloud. Okay, so now once we've done that, 
we move on to the second phase, the alignment phase. And getting alignment is probably the hardest part of any cloud journey. The reason for that is because in many cases, you're asking people to change. And any change, even good change, can be really hard to do. It's important in the alignment phase that you identify a single threaded leader who's responsible for your cloud adoption efforts. And this becomes even more critical the larger the organization becomes. Now, if you are a larger organization, that single threaded leader will likely have a team. And that team uh, will ideally oversee uh, you know, some sort of cloud team. You could call it a cloud center of excellence. You could call it a, a centralized cloud team. I mean, there's a lot of different names for it, but basically that individual and that group are responsible for helping the organization in adopting cloud services. In this phase, again, you're basically identifying, okay, well, remember in the envision phase, I've identified what my goal is. The alignment phase, I now talk through the details of what I'm trying to do. Who's going to do the work? How am I going to do the work? When is that work going to get done? So it's really putting some meat on the, the bones of that goal, if that makes sense. Okay, so let's talk about some concrete things that nonprofits can do here. So, so really, once you've identified your goal, you need to identify who owns each goal and get those stakeholders together so that you can identify requirements. Making sure that you include everyone who's going to interact with this project is going to be critical. You know, maybe you need to identify who your end users are, who's the developer, who's responsible for maintenance of this, of this solution that Oh, we lost sound, Damon. Are you able to? That's what I think so. Yeah. Hey, uh, Mike, if you can turn off your video, perhaps your bandwidth will be a little bit stronger. You're on a roll there, but um, we'll give you a couple of minutes to just pop back on. Not a problem. Um, I want to take this opportunity to uh, answer one of the questions that came in. It's a really good question. And the question comes from PFEW asking, uh, are there limits to what the $1,000 in AWS promotional credits can be used for? For instance, can they be used for existing AWS customers or can they be used to cover services such as light sale and route 53? So great question. And the answer is no matter whether you're a new customer or not, you can absolutely leverage the $1,000 in AWS promotional credits. And while there's a little bit of nuance in terms of what they cover. The vast majority of on-demand uh, services are covered. So absolutely to Route 53 and absolutely to light sale. So yes, you can use the credit no matter whether you're a brand new customer or an existing customer. And yes, they can be used for on-demand services such as light sale and Route 53. So back to you, Mike, you're on a roll and uh, let's pick up where we just left off. So I, I dropped there somewhere. I, can you help me know when I dropped? Was it on this slide? Or was exactly it right. Okay, great, great. So you, I, I, I wasn't talking on my own for five minutes there. Uh, no, 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 we're with you. It's just right. right at this slide. Awesome, great. Okay, so, so again, you know, uh, I was talking about the example of uh, maybe one of your, your concerns in moving to the cloud is that you don't have qualified staff. They don't have expertise in, in, in cloud. Great, well, we can help you with that. There are a lot of ways to help. We, we have training solutions. We have upskilling solutions. We can help you. Uh, connect with our ProServe team or one of our partners to, uh, again, help upskill your team or help you with staff augmentation or maybe even take on the project for you and then give it back to you once it's completed. So again, there's a lot of different ways that, that we can help you, but it's important during this phase to get your concerns out into the open to make sure that everyone's on the same page and is ready to get started. All right. So in the Envision phase, we figured out what our goal is. In the alignment phase, we figured out how we want to achieve that goal. We've surfaced any concerns we have. We've tried to resolve those. Now we're in the launch phase. The, really the launch phase is thinking about, well, it's really launching the thing that we're planning, you know, building and launching that. And then thinking through how do we know that we were successful? Have we established any success criteria? 
You know, what does the def what is the definition of done in our case? So make sh make sure you think through those criteria and have some really clear guidance so that you know whether your project was successful or not. So let's talk about some concrete examples here. Um, well, again, I, I I talked about how you know in the envision phase we we talk through our goal, we align on that, and then we we start building and deploying something. So really, it's important to identify a challenge. Working with us with AWS, we can help you design a solution and build out a pilot. Your pilot should have really clear goals and metrics. Again, we can we can certainly help you with that. You want to have these measurable outcomes so that you can identify uh, whether you were successful or not, and you can identify areas of improvement in the future. We talk a lot about working backwards here at AWS, and by that we mean figure out what that goal is and then trace your steps backwards to determine what steps you have to take to meet that goal that you want to achieve. When And we use this process to uh, to build our services, and it's how we support our customers. And by doing this, this helps us stay laser focused on th that opportunity that we want to uh, achieve, and it helps us maintain flexibility in how we achieve that goal. So as you go through this launch phase, be thinking about where's that value that we want to achieve? What technical constraints keep us from realizing it? And again, working with, with AWS or with partners that we help you work with, you can you can identify that process. You, you, you can identify uh, that, that value and make sure that you see that value in, in the projects that you launch. All right, and then the final phase is really the rinse and repeat phase where you know, you've launched something, you've now measured it, you've identified if there are any gaps. If there are, you can measure those gaps and go back through the envision alignment and launch phase to start closing those gaps, or maybe there's a new project that you want to develop. And then you just put that through this, the same phase again, where you envision, you, you align, you launch, and then measure. And what we found with a lot of customers is as they follow this process, you'll find that the, that initial win that you get will spark a lot of other ideas and, and projects. Oftentimes that first project is gonna be the most difficult, but once you begin it and start seeing some success, you're almost immediately gonna see a flywheel effect here. Okay, so let's talk about some ways that, that we can help you and some, some resources that are available to you. I have some QR codes, so feel free to scan these if you want. The first is our nonprofit credit program. Jamin talked about that at the beginning. This gives you access to up to $1,000 in promotional credits. You know, again, this allows you to begin building solutions without any upfront investment in physical infrastructure. We have our nonprofit technical hub. And this is where you can go if you're just starting your cloud journey, or maybe you're looking for, you know, what are other customers doing? What are the best practices for certain workloads that I'm trying to deploy? Our nonprofit technical hub has a lot of information in those areas. Maybe you need uh, you need help from a partner or you know someone to help you be successful. So that's really where our, our partner program comes into play here. Our uh, nonprofit competency partners can help by either providing end-to-end -end resources, uh, staff augmentation, project work, and basically help you be successful on whatever that that what is that you've defined during that envision process. And finally, you know, we want to help you. So that final QR code will take you to a contact us page. If you don't know who your account executive is, then let us know and we can put you in touch with who your account executive is. They can loop in a solutions architect like myself and we can help guide you on your cloud journey through these, these four phases that we've talked about. You know, keep in mind that we've helped over you know, 7,500 different government agencies, 14,000 different academic institutions, and 35,000 different nonprofit organizations. So we want to help you be successful. So in terms of your call to action, you know, what you can do, again, identify that what and the why of your cloud journey. Once you've identified those, then you simply align on how and who, how are you going to do it and who's going to do the work. You launch a pilot, you measure success, and then you iterate. That, that's really all there is to it. So let's open it up to Q&A. Jamin, I heard that you were answering some questions. Are there any additional questions we can help answer? 
Yeah, absolutely. First and foremost, thanks so much, Mike. Really appreciate that overview. Um, hopefully it was inspiring to the audience to get them started as well as to help them along their journey uh, to and on the cloud. I wanna highlight one question that we got that I think might resonate a lot with our audience members. Um, I, I think, one second, also, Mike, can you go back to the QR code? I think that would be also a good hold slide so people can kind of access these resources. But um, so the, excellent, excellent. So the question is, um, you know, this person has a simple website on WordPress and they fundraise through it, but they don't necessarily have the volume or the need for a robust call center. Uh, they don't get all that much traffic, but they know that the cloud has value, but they're trying to understand what might be a good kind of starting point for AWS for an organization that doesn't yet have that immediate banging on the door type of need. There are a lot of things to, to look at. I mean, the first thing is if, if you have a, a data center or a server in the closet or any sort of, any sort of computer that's, that's running that's, that's uh, supporting your, your mission or your membership, that is probably an opportunity to consolidate and, and put into AWS. You'll get better resiliency, you'll get better security. Um, you know, one of the problems with running things in, in your office is you see a computer under a desk and you say, what is this? What does this thing do? And people are like, well, I don't know. Turn it off. Eh, we're kind of afraid to. We don't want to break anything. You know, you don't really have great visibility when you're running servers on prem of, of uh, what they're actually doing. But when you put things into the cloud, you have complete visibility into everything that's running. Um, so you know, that's one thing I would think of. You know, I'd also think about what does your member outreach look like? We have a lot of services like uh, Amazon Pinpoint that allows you to have targeted messaging to your end users, whether it's through email or SMS or you know what have you. That's something to look at. Um, Jamin, what other? Do you have other uh, suggestions for that? Yeah, uh, those are excellent, and and I think in my experience from working with organizations with a similar sentiment and question, really just getting started opens the doors, the opportunities to questions, to people, to knowledgeable resources that help inform your journey, right? It's almost about the getting started helps you decide where you're going as opposed to understanding exactly what your destination might be and then getting started. So I think a combination of this uh, QR code on the far left, which is the credit program, plus the QR code on the far right, which is support from our nonprofit uh, team over here at AWS, those two things combined can empower your organization to experiment and to dip your toes in the water, get started to Mike's point, maybe explore some member and donor engagement, maybe see what you can do with your database that you haven't yet uh, considered. So um, all that combined, again, just get started. You can experiment kind of risk-free and then the rest seems to unfold from there. So excellent question. Um, I'm gonna go on to the next question. And uh, while I'm reading this, I wanna encourage all of our listeners to continue to ask their question. Um, I know you're here for a reason and you know we have this dedicated time for you to answer those questions. So the next one comes from a uh, viewer named Ashwin that says that they have some data and they know what kind of automation they want to do with it, but how do they know what services AWS can offer for achieving that automation? And maybe more over, Mike, you can explain to our audience with so many AWS services, where and how do they navigate um, and what resources are available to help them understand the connection between the service and the solution they're trying to achieve? Yeah, so there are a couple of things that, that come to mind here. First of all, I mean, when you log into the AWS console, we have a services drop down. If you drop down the services, you're going to see 200 plus services. And it can be overwhelming with the, the number of services that we have available. The first thing, again, I'd, I'd recommend is by using that QR code on the far right, you can get in touch with a solutions architect like myself. And we're more than happy to, to help you look at your workload and identify, okay, this piece right here, this should be 
an AWS Lambda function, this piece right here, this data transformation, this is a AWS glue job. I mean, so we can help identify what the specific services are for you. So, so that's one way to approach this. Another way to approach this is we have a solutions library where we have a lot of pre-built kind of vetted solutions that are common patterns we see people perform on AWS. You can go to our solutions library and in many cases, there's a template you can click that will deploy those resources in your account. So you don't really have to worry about building anything. It's pre-built for you as part of the solution. And then you can just put in your data and you're, you can go on your, your way. So those are two ideas that, that come to mind. Excellent. Um, great. I am going to move on to the next question. Thanks so much. I think it all comes back to leveraging the support that's out there already. Again, I can't emphasize this enough. What we hang our hat on is providing that unique customer experience and partnership experience for nonprofits. This isn't just another team that supports any type of organization, but moreover, we know the nuances and ins and outs unique to your organization. So get in touch with that uh, QR code on the right. So um, this is a little bit more of an uh, in-depth question, Mike. It comes from Justin that says, does AWS offer a hybrid cloud solution that enables on-premises data storage and access that syncs with cloud storage, specifically in relation to Amazon WorkDocs, but maybe you can also speak about it a little bit more as a high level about kind of a hybrid cloud solution and the pros and cons and what someone might want to do when considering that as an option. Yeah, so you know, we want to avoid the uh, the answer. It depends, you know, what in terms of what your solution is. But oftentimes we come back to that because it it really does depend on the specific use case. Maybe it's latency or performance requirements you have. There are a lot of different solutions, and you know, just to talk through those briefly. Yeah, there there are definitely some some hybrid solutions that that we have. Um, we have solutions with VMware where you can run VMware. VMs on-prem and in the cloud. Uh, we have solutions where maybe you want to run compute closer to your end users. We, we have solutions called AWS Outposts where you can run compute and databases really close to your users, but you control them from the AWS data plane. So the servers are physically installed in your data center, but you can control them through the AWS console. Um, there are likely other solutions that we have out there that I'm just not thinking of right now. But but again, feel free to contact us. Let's have a deep uh, dive on your use case and we can help you come up with a solution. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Mike. And um, speaking to that point of contact us, I just want to acknowledge we see the question from uh, T. T-E-E-H, it's a great question. It's about Elastic Beanstalk and the comparability between that and EC2 instances to that uh, uh, current viewer, definitely reach out to us, scan. We have the answer to that. And it's just a little bit more uh, in depth of a question. So um, can you talk a little bit, Mike, about what might be the future in terms of AI solutions for some of our nonprofit needs? Uh, in particular, we have a question from Joe, who's talking about a database that collects a data and uh, some frequently asked questions from their constituents. Um, and the question is, uh, can an AI solution, does AWS offer an AI solution for database to collect data or answers to questions posted in platforms like Quora or others? Once those responses are collected, can they be sorted to the most relevant and researched by AWS? So I think it's just an overview of the value and potential for AI to help with questions that come in frequently to organizations, as well as any other use cases you might be aware of. So, yeah, that great question. So first of all, I mean, let's talk about just briefly our AI ML stack. Uh, I don't want to get into it too deeply, but basically we have a couple of layers of our AI ML stack. We have kind of the DIY layer where you want to manage everything yourself. You're super comfortable with really deep ML stuff. We have a layer above that where you're deep in ML, but you don't want to manage infrastructure. And we have a layer above that where I don't want to manage anything and I may or may not know anything about ML, but I want to take advantage of ML services. So we have, you know, services like Amazon recognition, which is a computer vision service. We, we have the ability to create chat bots. We have uh, the ability to create uh, forecasts. Uh, there's, there's dozens and dozens of different services. So, so what I'm seeing in terms of like a trend 
in AI ML is continuing to lower that bar so that it's easier for people that don't have machine learning expertise to get into to ML. Um, getting into ML with, 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 you know, without having some of these higher level services is a challenge. Like you really need like a deep background in statistics or data science or, or something like that. But by, by removing some of those obstacles, we've really made it a lot easier for people that literally have no knowledge of how machine learning works to take advantage of that. Now, in terms of that specific question, uh, you know, we do have services like Amazon Kendra, which is a, uh, it's essentially a full text indexing and, and searching solution where it can index content that, that you gather. Maybe that's questions from, uh, from other sites or content that you have and users can enter queries and it can automatically find the most relevant content for you. Uh, but there's a, a lot of other things we could do as well, uh, just depending on what the specific use case is there. So it's a, it's a very deep and broad topic. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's, you know, can, can sometimes be scary and, and we want to recognize that, but at the same time, it's empowering. I mean, um, I'm confident in saying that it's really not about if the cloud, it's really more about when. So I, I want to applaud everyone who's still here with us, who showed up, who are really investing in understanding how this technology can bring value to your organization, because this is absolutely the right first step. You are in the right place. And between what Mike has provided um, in the past 40 or so minutes, as well as these resources that are right in front of us on the screen, we are here to support you in your learning and in your progress and in your journey and using AWS for mission impact. So um, I want to wrap up with one last question. Um, you know, oftentimes we are uh, don't have the opportunity to have an audience of nonprofits um, like we do currently. And I want to ask a question. I'm going to post it in the chat as well. Um, give me one second. But essentially, I'd like for you all to share for the sake of our understanding and to continue to provide as best of support as possible, a little bit more insight into what would be most valuable in terms of support or continued support to help you use AWS. So go ahead and look in your chat and answer one, two, or three. So if it's one, it's that you've already leveraged the AWS promotional credit, but you're looking for more. If it's two, you really wanna speak with peers and your community to understand how, how they're leveraging AWS and how you can make use of what they've done to add value to your organization. And then the third one is if you're looking for trainings, you want to just explore on your own and learn on your own. So I see some, some answers coming in there. Thank you so much. I'm seeing some ones and threes, some twos and threes. Okay, threes. So um, excellent. Thank you very much. This is really informative. Again, it helps Mike, myself, and our entire AWS team ensure that we're providing you with those specific resources that are needed to leverage the cloud for mission impact. So um, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. It's our pleasure to see you here again, to restate for the sake of emphasis, you are absolutely in the right place. It's, all, it's not a matter of if, but really a matter of when the cloud continues to provide value for your nonprofit. So with that, um, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Please uh, take a moment to scan some of these QR codes to get in touch and upwards and onwards. We'll see you on the cloud. Thanks so much. Thanks all.